Well, now I have a little session on the mysteries of forestry. And I'll just, just acknowledge uh, JP and Peter Hanford uh, from Ground Truth who put uh, quite a bit of this data together uh, for me. So, forestry. <coughs> there's, there's two magic dates with forestry. The first of, if you had a forest that was first planted prior to the 31st of December 1989, it is not eligible for the ETS and you can't claim carbon credits on it. End of story. If you chop that forest down and turn it into grass, or anything for that matter, um, you would pay the full carbon liability on that. And just to think on this for a moment, let's say in simple terms, pine forest, 800 tonnes of carbon and mature, that's 800 tonnes per hectare, mature forest, 25 bucks a tonne, that's 20 grand a hectare. Why are we not converting forests to dairy farms? Well, that's just one little stumbling block. The second magic date is that if you planted your forest post the 1st of January 1990, it is eligible for the ETS and it is eligible to, to sell the credits or use them as offsets. If you want to convert that forest into pasture, then you would still face uh, the, the carbon tax. You would have to pay the tax equivalent to the amount of credits that you'd sold. Or claimed, sorry, not sold, claimed. So, so if you claimed them all on the sitting in the bank, you'd just hand them all back again. <coughs> now, if the forest was planted post 1st of January 1990 and it's not in the ETS, and it's not compulsory to register for the ETS, um, then you can do what you like with it. And believe me, there's one or two forests out there like that. But it's really that 1st of January 1990 is the magic date in a sense. Now in terms of, of what is a forest according to the ETS? So the first thing is it must have a minimum area of one hectare. It must <coughs> be at least 30 metres wide and we're thinking um, um, riparian strips here. And <coughs> let's say we've got five metres of riparian strip on this side of the stream and we've got the streams 20 metres wide and we've got another five metres. You do not have 30 metres of, of riparian strip. <laughs> <laughs> You've got 30 metres, but it's not quite a trees. Anyhow, so the gaps mustn't be any greater than 15 by 15 metres. The trees, when mature, must be capable of growing 5 metres or higher. And it must co cover a minimum of 30% of the ground, uh, and that's on a horizontal plane. So, at the moment, what it does not include are shelter belts, any fruit or, or nut crops. And the nut crop's actually quite important because so people growing walnuts and almonds and all that sort of stuff will get quite upset because they're big trees and all the rest of it. They're not a forest, sorry. Well, not at the moment. And any, any native forest that existed prior to that 31st of December 8, 1980, yeah, 1989. But anyhow, so that's the definition of a forest. Now, in some areas, <coughs> and this is a, an example in terms of pop planting poplars for erosion control, what well, they were originally planted, um, if they meet some of that cr criteria, particularly greater than 30% canopy cover, they would qualify. So this little photo, the reason I'm showing this is this qualifies as a forest. So it was planted this side of 1990, Bob's your uncle. And, and, and again, sorry, just to go back a step. In terms of that average, it's an average of 30 metres wide. So you need to get a little creative here, so you might have five metres and then 10 metres, and then you might have a big block that's three or 400 metres wide. As long as it's contiguous, you just add it up and you know, divide by three or whatever. So I measure the number of trees in that poplar stand today, is that how it's done? Or is it well, the, 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 the key thing there is um, it's certainly greater than one hectare, um, meets that. The, probably the main one there would be greater than 15 um, metres, by 15, and it's covering more than 30%. So as long as it meets those criteria. So this graph is just to show you the, the um, um, sequestration rates for different species. So the first line there, the green line, and that's in, in your book, is the exotic hardwoods, so that's eucalypts and poplars. The purple is uh, our good old uh, radiata, and that's for the Waikato, and it varies by region. The red line there is our exotic softwoods, so that's your redwoods and cypresses, that sort of thing. 
and the blue line is our indigenous. Now at the moment, indigenous covers everything. It, it includes Manuka, so Manuka is the same as Rimu, which is the same as Kauri, which is the same as bloody Totra, or anything else. If you are looking at forestry or your clients are looking at forestry, there's these lookup tables on the MPI website. I'd strongly recommend you download and, and, and have a look at them. Um, there's a lot of information in there. What they do is give the sequestration rate by year by species. And for pine trees, they give it by region. So this is your little Bible, if you like, in terms of, of looking at, at sequestration rates and, and by species. Um, so those are the standard things that, as I say, MPI. If you're growing more than 100 hectares of forest, then you have to measure them. So you get in certified people every five years, and they'll go and measure and, and work out how much carbon has been sequestered by that, that particular block over that period. The good news is, is, is from what I understand, quite a lot of the, um, the measurements that are happening have, have ended up being slightly better than what's in the lookup tables. But it comes at a cost, obviously, because you've got to pay these guys to get in there and wrap their arms around a few trees. And we've touched on this before, so I um, can't see my laser. So one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent equals uh, NZU. A mature pine tree is roughly 2.5 cubic metres of wood, which is roughly 2.5 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, or 2.5 NZUs. Now, there's, <clears throat> in terms of how forestry is, is measured in that for, for carbon sequestration, um, there, are, there are variations around that, and I'll just skip that bit and go straight to um, in my little graphs. So, this is a representation, this is for pine forest um, somewhere in the Waikato. So we've planted it here, and it's busy sequestering carbon over its 28 year lifestyle. So um, you, can, you, can, you can sell it, or you can offset it, whatever, um, depending what you want to do with it, you know, assuming it's all regist registered with the ETS and that sort of stuff. Then we come to, in year 28, we've sold it, uh, sorry, we've harvested it. So under the ETS, when you harvest a forest, <coughs> it deems that roughly 70% of the carbon stored vanishes, it evaporates, okay? So at that immediate point in time, while you've been busy selling over here, you then have to repay all of that, all in one hit. Now the reason it's only 70% is that the remainder, you've got your roots, um, your stumps, and your slash. Now they decay over time, and they obviously, that goes into CO2 if you like. So that decays over, over time, but what you've done is you've planted your new forest, and that grows away. So the new forest growing, offsets that last roughly 30% that's decaying. Then, once you get this point and they've, they've leveled off, you can then sell that carbon again. Obviously, you have to repay the 100% because you've only claimed that amount. Same story and away you go. So that's, that's what I've called uh, total carbon. Now, so all that's well and good. <coughs> there is a bit of a risk around this because it depends what price you sold it at and what price you got to repay it at. So let's say, for example, it's 25 bucks over the lifetime of the, the um, while it's growing, and it's still 25 bucks when you, when you have to repay. What you've gained is the, is the time value of that money, which is actually quite worthwhile. The question, though, is, or part of the risk is, let's say you've sold it at 25 bucks, and then just before it, you harvest, it turns into 50 bucks. Okay, so you're about to take a financial bath. Um, but then, let's say you've sold it at 25 bucks, and when you come to sell, it's only worth 10 bucks. Well, you've just had a financial windfall. All you have to do is work out what the price is going to be in 28 years. So <coughs> that's pretty straightforward, as always. So that's part of the, 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 the risk around that, if you like. Now. At the moment, this scheme has been in for a little while, is that what you could do is you could claim what's called tradable without penalty, or safe carbon, which is roughly that amount there, which is around, let's say, about a quarter. Now you can sell that, and you do not need to repay at harvest. That's the good news. 
The bad news is you can only do that for one rotation. And in terms of the, the existing um, uh, scheme, in effect, that really relates to trees that are planted from 2008 onwards. Now, in terms of the, the, the second rotation, if you wanted to, you could really still resell. You can sell that, but then you have to pay 100% back at harvest and so on. So for intents and purposes, you claim that as, as free carbon, and then you're into a, into a timber regime. Carbon's out of the, out of the equation. Now recently the government's changed the rules a little bit in terms of, of uh, what they've called an averaging scheme, which really relates to forests, you know, if, if you're into forestry and you've got, uh, you've got uh, stands that have different ages over, over, in terms of their growth, you can average it out over that period, but <clears throat> that's how it came about. What happens here is now is that you can, you can um, claim up to what's called the average, which is roughly half. So again, let's say for argument's sake, our, our forest has got 800 tonnes at maturity. So you can sell uh, your carbon up to the point that it reaches to 400 tonnes, or halfway, which for most pine forests is about year 18 or 19. So you can sell up to then and then you stop. You do nothing else. And again, the good news is that when you, when you harvest, you do not need to pay that back. The bad news again is that it's only good for one rotation. Okay, now, if you really wanted to, in the second rotation, you could look at selling, the, you know, the, the second half, so to speak, but again, you have to pay the whole lot back when you um, harvest. So again, what most, uh, I find most farm forestry operations are looking at is they'll claim forest, uh, claim carbon, sorry, for the first rotation, and then they're basically into a timber regime thereafter. Now that kicks in um, in 2020. I understand, because the ETS works in five year months, I'm not sure whether you can <coughs> claw the first five years back if you've already planted or not, but um, you need to talk to your forestry advisor about that. Now, but all things being equal, this is quite an advantageous scheme, really, and it takes a lot of the risk out relative to, if we go back to that system. Um, now, the other thing, that the forestry industry is talking to, to government about is, of course, not all, you know, when you chop down the tree, not all the carbon vanishes overnight, so to speak. If it goes into houses or furniture, that sort of thing, obviously it's going to hang around for another, let's say, 100 years or so. Um, my, my understanding is that the government's reasonably sympathetic to that idea in terms of building that aspect into, into, into what you can claim and what you have to pay back. Not in there at the moment, but watch the space. How much it is remains to be seen, given that over half our production forest goes overseas as logs, which mostly goes into, um, into um, boxing timber and then gets burnt. So that's 100% vanish. A good proportion goes into, into pulp and paper. Um, so again, all things being equal, that's going to vanish. So only a proportion of what we harvest goes into more permanent type um, timber structures. This is the, uh, the, the next, ex, next uh, aspect and, and uh, it's interesting, all the farmers I've talked to have simply not grasped this idea and I'd have to say most consultants haven't either and that's the point that forestry is not a permanent solution. So what I've got there is just a hypothetical, I've said 100 hectares is sufficient for me to, I'm a farmer, I've planted 100 hectares which is a sufficient offset my emissions for the next 28 years. So I planted pines, obviously. That's fine. Year 28, I, I cut the trees down, harvest them to timber. What that means is I've offset my emissions for 28 years, but then most of it's disappeared into the ether. So I have to replant, and most of those greenhouse gases are still sitting up there in the atmosphere. So I have to replant that 100 hectares to continue to offset the emissions that I've already made. Okay, but I'm still sit there farming and I'm going to emit more greenhouse gases into the future. So I have to plant another 100 hectares to offset my next 28 years. So I get to year 56, I'm getting a bit old now, but anyhow, <coughs> I chop those, those 200 hectares down, but I have to replant those 200 hectares 
because the greenhouse gas emissions that they offset for the previous 68, uh, 56 years, sorry, are still up in the atmosphere. So I have to replant my 200 hectares. I then have to replant another 100 hectares to offset my emissions for my next 28 years. Now, it might be quite 100 hectares that I plant because my farm's starting to shrink a bit by now, but you, you grasp the principle, okay? So that's what I mean, forestry is not a permanent solution. If New Zealand did absolutely nothing but plant trees, in 200 years, the whole country's in bloody pine trees, okay? That's, that's assuming you're into a harvesting cycle, but if you planted a permanent forest, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be a power to stop. Um, yes and no. So you plant in, in, in um, natives, yeah. which was sequestered, say, for 200 odd years, yeah. and then they re reach an equilibrium. Um, so you, you, you're not offsetting, you still need to plant more forest, to, assuming you're farming in 200 years, to go on. So, so planting forest extends that, that, that period, but the principle is still the same. Now the other thing I thought you might be interested in is the amount of forest we need to plant to offset. So the theory is, I'm going to plant trees on my farm to offset the emissions from my farm. I, ignoring the um, you can't offset methane because you can because you'll, you'll buy and sell, okay? <coughs> so it's a little technically in the scheme of things. So this is our average dairy farm, this is the average sheep and beef farm. So it added 5% um, offset, which is what we're going to start the system at. A dairy farm, we call that 6 hectares and we call that 8 hectares, okay? Now, think about this in the real world. The average 640 hectares sheep and beef farm, probably easy to have 8 hectares they can plant. I'm not quite sure that the average 151 hectare, uh, hectare dairy farm would have had six hectares they can plant. What's they might, but they'll be pushing the limits. What's the total in average? Oh, sorry. This comes at the, the total was that first graph where I, I showed you were, were claiming the total amount of carbon over the life and then reselling it and repaying. The average is the, is the very latest averaging scheme where you can claim half and you don't need to pay back um, when you harvested it that first rotation. <coughs> which means that if you like, <coughs> you go along these, the, the average is twice the total. Sort of cunning how those sort of things work out. Now, I, I'd have to say, in my travels, I'd say the average sheep and beef farm, particularly the hill country farms, could probably plant 5% of the property, probably even 10%, without seriously affecting their partial operation. Most of the dairy farms might have one or two or three hectares, um, but that's about it. So in terms, if you jump, let's go to the extreme because that's always the interesting area. So we have to, let's say we have to offset 100% um, of our emissions and we're going to do it through forestry. So our sheep and beef farm would have to plant 159 hectares. Tough but doable on that size farm. Our dairy farm has to plant 116 hectares. Okay, so the farm's stuffed. You can't do it. So there's a little issue there in terms of dairy farming and using trees as offset. Now, some dairy farmers are buying sheep and beef farms to plant trees, that's fine, um, but there's 11,500 dairy farms out there, um, and they can't all buy um, sheep and beef farms to, to use as, as an offset. The other thing I just thought you might be interested in, this was um, uh, this is a case study I did, it's a farm in Hawke's Bay, so what we're doing is buying the farm, it's a sheep and beef farm, and we're going to plant the whole lot in, in, in pine trees. <clears throat> so you do a bit of a cost-benefit analysis, and, and um, the answer seems reasonably straightforward. So as a sheep and beef farm, I'm getting 4.5% on my investment. If I just look at the timber component of forestry, I'm getting 7.9. If I whack in carbon, this is the averaging, the latest averaging scheme, uh, whacking carbon at 25 bucks a tonne, I'm getting almost 15%. Carbon at 50 bucks a tonne, I'm getting 12, 24%. Why are people buying sheep and beef farms to plant in trees? Well, three guesses, guys. Is it going to happen? It's happening now, and it's going to accelerate. You know, the genie is out of the bottle. Unless the government directly stop, comes in and says, no, you can no, no longer do it, it's too late. It's going to happen. Um, What's all about nitrogen problem? Well, a lot of co-benefits. 
Now, the other interesting thing to think about is, I, I mean, the reason it looks so good with carbon is you're getting that cash flow right up front. The, the, the problem, if you like, with forestry in the financial sense, sense is you have to wait 28 years to, to, till you harvest. So 28 years is a long time to wait for breakfast, okay? But the carbon solves that because you can cash flow over that first 18 to 19 years. <coughs> now, as I said before, carbon, under that averaging scheme, you can only claim that carbon in the first rotation. Thereafter, all things being equal, you're back to a, a forestry regime. So just think on this. The best thing <coughs> you can do is jump in and go carbon farming. Depends on the price, obviously. But in year 20, you're not going to get any more money from carbon. So why the hell do you want to hang around? It'll be in another 10 years before you get money from your, your timber. So you sell up and get out. Someone who's interested in forestry for timber. Under a, we're, this is under the averaging scheme, Rob. So you only you can claim half the, the amount that the, the trees sequester as it happens. So that usually that half way mark usually happens in about year eighteen nineteen. Yep. Well, is it a, a, <coughs> a lease situation, or a, a, you buy a farm and you want the half there was a forest there and it's been harvested? Like where does that liability lie? Lies with the well. It's a good question. Could I go back? <coughs> Go back to that, that little slide there. So forests have been growing away and the current owner has been um, selling carbon or whatever. And next thing is we get to, let's say, year 25 and he decides to sell to you. So two things. You'll get that last little five years worth of carbon and you'll also inherit the whole 70% liability. Okay? So if you're, not up to, if you're not awake to that, you're going to get burned. What you do, because you are awake to it, is when you buy it, you buy up at a price that's commensurate with the risk that you're taking. But I'll give you a classic example: um, the forestry company uh, or forestry uh, block um, alongside a, a pastoral farm. The company had harvested the trees and they wanted to do a boundary realignment. So they said to the farmer, "Look, we'll build this this new fence which fitted more with the contour of the land, and and we will give you uh, the the land that came out of the trees." which would be in stumps, of course. Um, and the farmer says, well, that's a pretty good idea because I'll get 20 hectares of land for free. No, you don't. Because the trees have been harvested and if you don't replant within two years, you face the full liability. Well, it wasn't 20 grand back then, but close enough. So the short story was that that was a very bad deal for the farmer. So what I said to him, negotiate with the forestry company that they pay most of that liability. You might have to pay some of it, but at least you're getting it in essence, you're buying that land based on that liability. So you have to be very careful around uh, that sort of issue. <coughs> the other thing, just to think on this for a moment, guys, is um, <coughs> in terms of, of who's buying the, these forests and, and where the money's going to end up. Now, I'm not sure this has occurred to government yet, but there's... We'll ignore the, 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 the actual monetary value, but let's just say over here in cheap beef farming, we're exporting 245 bucks worth of meat, give or take. We come over here, I mean, we've still got timber, but there's about 350 bucks worth of carbon tied up there. Now, if I'm an overseas company, I'll sell the carbon domestically in New Zealand, <coughs> and then I'll repatriate that money back overseas. That is an import. So if you like, we're swapping that export for that import. Not a great thing in terms of our macroeconomics, particularly if it's done at scale. Now, the other thing I just thought I'd touch on is, is native forests. Now, in terms of talking with, with farmers, it's interesting how much they hate pine trees. <laughs> and most of them are talking about planting natives, which is, I mean, good on them. There's no problem there. But you need to think on, on this in an investment sense and the value of carbon. Now, you've got two problems with native forestry. The first is that the establishment costs uh, 10 times more, give or take, compared to pine trees. So for pine trees, you'd probably establish a hectare for around 1,500 bucks. You buy a seedling for 18-odd cents. 
You buy a native seedling, it's anything between $2 and $10, and you have to plant three, four, five thousand of them per hectare. Because the little suckers die quite easily. So your establishment cost for, for natives is anything between $10,000 and $30,000 a hectare. Okay? Now at the moment, the government's giving you a $4,000 um, subsidy, so that's all well and good. What I've worked this example on was a $10,000 a hectare establishment, less 4000 subsidy, so it's actually a net six. But it's a big upfront cost. And then the second thing with natives is, of course, they grow slowly, so they sequester uh, uh, carbon quite slowly. So I took it out to 50 odd years, and by that stage they'd sequestered about half what a pine forest would do in, in um, 28 years. So you get high upfront costs, long, slow sequestration. Plays hell with your investment, okay? As you can see from the figures. So I don't want to put off <coughs> your clients from planting uh, natives, not at all, but they need to understand they're not going to make money out of it in, in terms of carbon. They might in terms of the amenity value of their property. People who are going to make money out of it in terms of carbon are their grandkids and their great-grandkids. And believe me, there's plenty of farmers happy with that idea. But just a little wrinkle. Now, this comes back to this question that came up, and this is part of my cunning idea. Some of you are old enough here to, to remember the old Black Adder TV series and with Rowan Atkins, and he had a sidekick, um, Baldrick. Baldrick was always coming up with cunning ideas. <laughs> so... In terms of, if you look at forestry from a timber perspective, there's, there's two things that, that have a big impact on, on the profitability. One is the distance to the port or mill where you're going to sell your, your, your trees to. And if it's more than 100 hectares, <coughs> it becomes a big cost and it has a big impact on that profitability. The other thing is, if you're planting out the back of the farm on the steep areas and the more remote and all the rest of it, you have to spend a lot of money putting in tracks and, and whatnot in order to get the trees out. So, given those sort of circumstances, if you like, if, it, <coughs> if the profitability of, of the trees for timber is somewhat um, pro problematic, then the idea is <coughs> you, you still plant them because you want the carbon. <coughs> so you plant them in pine trees because pine trees are the best in terms of sequest sequestering carbon. doesn't matter whether you like them or not. <coughs> we want to make money out of this. So you plant them in pine trees, you shut the gate and walk away. So over the next 100 years, you sell the carbon as the, as the trees grow up towards maturity. Once they get to you know, around 100 years, give or take, they'll be starting to fall over and die because pine trees are not a climax species, right? Um, you know, if we all vanished, you know, 500 years, Kaingaroa would be all the natives again, okay? So the idea is... The, natives, the, the pines will grow, they'll start falling over, and the natives will, will be coming up underneath. Now, you might have to give the natives a bit of a helping hand, get in there and chop the odd tree down and, and plant a few natives. And the idea, if you like, is so you, you, your carbon sequestration is going like that, the pines are starting to level off, and as it starts to level off, your natives come through and um, take over, and you're good for another couple of hundred years. Now, you may not personally be around to see that, but... Um, that's the theory. Now, I haven't actually modelled this through yet. This is, as I say, this is at the cunning plan stage. But the theory is good. <laughs> um, so that's trees. So just, just to summarise, if you like, trees, suit, and there's 101 reasons why most farms should be planting more trees, quite apart from carbon. In terms of carbon, certainly they're an option in the toolbox for um, offsetting our, our, our partial emissions. But there are a few little issues and wrinkles with trees. They're not a permanent solution. Get very good advice. <laughs>